Introduction takes about 14 minutes, and chapter one takes about 11. And then we'll have a little chat about some things, and then if you want to hear more, we'll do that, and if not, we'll get to the writing problem. So, this is So Far Appalachia, a memoir of American mythology. Ready, darling? All right. The borderlands, as this region was known, were remote and lawless territories that had been fought over for hundreds of years. And when they immigrated to North America, they moved into the American interior, to remote, lawless, rocky, and marginally fertile places like Harlem that allowed them to reproduce in the new world the culture of honor that they had created in the old world. Malcolm Gladwell and Outliers. I don't remember the moment I realized I was an Appalachian. I just assumed that everybody's life looked similar to mine. My parents square danced, our family camped, and we listened to real country music like Johnny Cash. We didn't exactly live in the middle of nowhere, but we were a good 40 minute drive from Cincinnati, which was the nearest big city. That Cincinnati was a river city and a destination for Appalachians migrating from central and eastern Kentucky was lost on me then. But when we went to the city, I saw a place that didn't look altogether that different from the small country town where I lived. And when I went to college at Miami University, itself nestled in a small town in Oxford, Ohio, it didn't feel entirely foreign. The experience of my friends were just close enough to mine I could overlook some of the small, subtle economic differences in our lives. So that's a brief introduction to tell you this isn't a story that will be filled with dramatic moments of profound self-identification. When you're born in and you grow up in Appalachia, you don't think about it any more than you think about the air around you. It's just what you live in. It's not until you're without it that it becomes something you realized you needed. Instead, this is a story about what it means to be something and not know it. This is a story of the long, slow burn that you feel when there are forces pushing upon you, forces you can't identify, and forces that slowly squeeze you in ways you don't even realize. My goal is to tell you a story about those invisible forces that I believe have shaped the Appalachian experience, and then to convince you that those are the forces that help us know who we all are as Americans. To do that, I'm going to tell you the story of my family, the Bakers, who left England in 1624, settled in Boston, made their way to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, down to Wilkes County, North Carolina, and over to Clay County, Kentucky, and finally out to Indiana, Arizona, California, and Oregon. Along the way, they found themselves at the center of much of our country's early history, and our story tells one that's a bit different than some of what you've heard before. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We have an entire book to get to that. For now, we've got a bit more backstory to get through. The Very Long Night of Brad King. There is no doubt whatever that I was dead to begin with, and this was jail. The knives pushed deeply, violently into my brain. I coaxed open my eyes, and I felt the snaking stream of piss just before I saw it worm its way down the concrete floor, a good four feet from its riverhead against the block wall. For a few moments, a warm wash of nausea swept through my body. The cell was, large, was a large square room built with a concrete from ceiling to floor. On the north wall was another smaller room with a metal toilet and sink. There was nothing else, no place to sit, no place to lay down save for the floor, and at the moment, no other people. The large steel door had been swung open, leading into the holding area. I laid on the floor soaked in that piss trying to regain my wits, but I couldn't put together how I could both be in a cell and have the ability to just leave. Excited myself. I tried to piece together the events of the last evening that had led me to the Kenton County Detention Center on Mother's Day. The memory flashes were short. I spent the day drinking with my colleagues from Northern Kentucky University to celebrate the end of the 2008 school year. Late into the evening, with nearly one half day behind us, a small group found our way to the last bar of the night. Not long into that stop, my girlfriend, who was then in the midst of a divorce, whispered that she wanted to swing by my place before she returned to, my, returned to her family. Fueled by whiskey and hormones, I tore out of the parking lot and sideswiped a cab. Instead of stopping, I jammed on the gas and sped out onto the highway. I pulled into the university's parking lot. I wasn't sure if anyone followed me, but just to be safe, my girlfriend and our friend scampered out of the car, the evening now over. I waited for everyone to get inside the building, pulled my car around the corner, and saw the red flashing lights in front of me. How much have you been drinking tonight, Mr. King, the officer asked. Enough that I'm going to jail, I said. Ten hours later, I awoke on the floor of that detention center without my wallet, 
my cell phone, and any way to contact the outside world. The very nice clerk with a sympathetic smile handed me the white pages. You really don't have anybody's phone number? I do, I said. It's not with me. I flipped to the K's, found my father's name, wrote down the number, and handed the slip to the bondsman. Hello, is this John King, he asked. This is the Kenton County Detention Center. Your son is okay, but he was arrested for a DUI last night. He's here right now, but he needs to be picked up or we're going to put him in the population. Silence. No, he's okay. You can't talk to him until you come down here, but he's fine. Everything's fine. Nobody's hurt. Silence. Tell them I'm sorry and that I love them, I said. He hung up the phone and looked at me. They'll be down in a bit. They just sat down for lunch. He said they're going to finish that first. The legacy of Malcolm Gladwell. A month after I'd awoken in that jail, I was glued to the green lounge chair in my living room, sitting in the dark. I couldn't remember the last time I ate, and sleep came in random short intervals. I filled my days staring at the plain white walls in my apartment, thankful that the outside world was held at bay while I struggled through each long, painful second. For most people, seconds tick by unnoticed. For the recovering addict, these seconds hold a lifetime. Your every mistake, your every misdeed, your every misstep, and your every vile act played in a movie, repeated in one second cycles. There is no justice, there is certainly no peace. If you are one of the lucky ones, those seconds compile into minutes, compile into hours, compile into days. The movie fades, and those moments turn into emptiness that need filling. A reader at heart, I picked up Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers, in hopes of filling some of those times with stories other than mine. And while I hoped to escape, I came face to face with my kin. The bakers of Clay County, Kentucky, sprang forth from the pages of Gladwell's book, and not in the way I'd ever heard them discussed. I flipped through page after page, growing angry as Gladwell's narrative argued that the violent clan warfare in the Cumberland re region was proof that parents can pass down heritage without expressly encouraging children to be violent. The nature of your life, he argued, was passed to your children. I'd always been aware that I'd been born in Appalachia, but Gladwell's book was a visceral experience, one that brought home the idea to much of the world, Appalachians are different. Washed away in his narrative and the popular mythologies Americans carry with them was this truth. Poor people don't own land, and poor people don't run governments. Gone was the acknowledgement that the families who feuded in Clay County were well-to-do elite families fighting over an increasingly small economic pie brought on by the collapse of the salt market, a crumbling transportation infrastructure, and national competition for goods. Gone was the discussion of lawlessness that came when the courts near bankrupted lost the ability to function in a timely manner. Erased was mention of speculators from outside the area pushing the sustainable agricultural economy to the side while gobbling up farmland for salt and timber. Gladwell conjured up the popular mountain man imagery, not in search of a truth about the region, but as an intellectual brick in his argument. While he did get right that the Bakers are from England, he got some of the details wrong about the kind of people they were before the feud. The men who settled in this history weren't the poor and unfortunate souls of his clans. They were men of means, educated and respected enough to earn the trust of those in power. Here's how my Baker story has been passed down to me. The Bakers were an educated, well-respected family in most of the places they lived. In the late 1500s, Robert I of Kent and Buckinghamshire County in England served as a knight to Queen Elizabeth, known as the Virgin Queen, which would help pave the way for my family to come to the New World. Andrew Baker, son of Robert I, arrived in Boston from Buckinghamshire, England in 1624, and soon found his way to Pennsylvania, where his son John and his grandson Robert II would be granted the first gun-making mill in Lancaster where he was charged by the King of England to help make the Kentucky Rifle, one of the first natively manufactured guns in America and designed for the traveling frontiersmen who would use it both for hunting and protection. Robert II's son, Caleb, would migrate with other bakers to Virginia and North Carolina in the late 1700s, where they lived on plantations before the family moved into Clay County, where Caleb's grandson, Abner Baker Sr., was elected to two terms of the Kentucky State Legislature before retiring to become the first clerk for the circuit and county courts of Clay County in 1807, the year of the county's formation. That my family had engaged in a bloody clan warfare is undeniable. That they'd come from violent clans was absolutely untrue. But until I read Gladwell's book, 
I hadn't understood the difference between being Appalachian and the idea of the Appalachian. Of course, the great irony is that my anger of Gladwell's portrayer of my family began because of a piss-filled jail cell. And all of that happened just months after then-presidential candidate Barack Obama wondered why people from my region clung to their religion and their guns. But here's the thing. If you and I are honest, Obama wasn't the only one who wondered that. I've heard that question posed too many times in too many ways to believe Appalachian contempt is party-affiliated. I found Obama's gaffe no more offensive than television hosts like Sean Hannity or Bill O'Reilly extolling the virtuous nature of the hard-working coal miner. I found it no more offensive than the person who once said to me, I'm not used to really smart things coming out of a mouth with an accent like yours. There's a great and long tradition of educated people using Appalachia to meet whatever rhetorical need they have, whether it be using poverty to decry policies on the right or using the hard-working poor to decry policies on the left. None of these folks knew what life was like in Appalachia. All of this was just talk, another bullshit day in Appalachia. So here we are, you and I, and we're in a bit of an odd predicament, and there's no real clear way to get out. For all my anger and grandstanding, I'm not much different than you when it comes to finding answers. This is what I know. The more I dug into the story of my family, the less Gladwell's picture matched the stories I found. And maybe this shouldn't be surprising. Countless scholars have explored the ideas of the American and the Appalachian mythologies. Gladwell, like so many others before him, just took the ones most suited to his narrative. And that's aided by the reality that these clan warring mythologies that have been passed, uh, that ha have more than a passing basis in truth. It's no secret that the Scottish and Irish helped settle Appalachia and that in the 19th century, there were 41 documented feuds in the region. The problem is those mythologies have taken root in popular culture. And they've become the definitive history. Being Appalachian means keeping your personal family history as well as the mythological histories relayed across the airways and popular trade books. Those mythologies sway in the wind, and the stories depend upon the needs of the popular media of the time, but they never blow through the individual leaves on the tree. And that brings us back to where we were started, back to where we started. I don't know when I realized I was Appalachian, but I've come to realize that that identity, what that identity means in the world. Realizing that has helped me reach a deep, unscratchable itch, which is why I've written this book. I agree with Gladwell on one issue, legacy matters. So let me tell you a story about my family and the Appalachia that I've come to know. A story that will be as true as I can make it, and one that is invariably filled with its own mythologies passed down from generation to generation. This isn't meant to be the definitive history of Appalachia. It's one small story about one small family. It's how I see Appalachia so far. It's my American mythology. So that's the introduction to So Far Appalachia which hopefully gives you as many questions about what the book is about as answers. Um, the essence that will be revealed throughout the book is, if you has anybody read Outliers? So part two is all about my family, which kind of clearly pissed me off and made me write a book about it. Um, and as I started reading, I mean, obviously I grew up reading Appalachian literature, but Appalachia was, as my wife said last night, like, how do you grow, how do you, how are you born in Appalachia and not think about it? And the reality is nobody talked about Appalachia and Appalachia. Like, I, didn't, like we didn't, I wasn't raised to think um, that that was an identity. It wasn't until I left that, that that identity was sort of given to me. And so much of the book is an exploration of what that means. And the writing prompt that we're going to talk about tonight, or that you guys will do tonight, is called A Moment in Stories. And you're going to hear, the reason I picked these two readings is I mind some of the same things that have happened to me for different reasons. I mean, obviously I'm a nonfiction writer. So we'll talk, or hopefully you guys will talk a little bit about that in your writing, about mining moments for specific um, reasons. And that's a lot of what this process has been for me, is that I start out summarizing stuff and then I spend a lot of time digging back through those summaries and looking for the individual moments that I can pull out. So I've written about 100,000 words in So Far Appalachia, and right now I have about 4,000 that I'm keeping. Because it's just lots of like writing, throwing away, throwing away, trying to get down to these individual moments when things happen. So what you're going to hear now is chapter one, which is when the actual book starts.